Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we present you with a conversation about the history of settler colonialism, what it is and how it works. My guest for this conversation is renowned scholar of indigenous history, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is the author of such books as An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Her latest book is called Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, great to see you. I, I haven't seen you since the beginning of the uh, pandemic, So, but now we're seeing each other over Zoom, and it's great to see you. It's great to see you, Mitch, and even over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to start off um, talking about United States as a settler state, uh, and you write that United States was the first full-fledged settler state. What do you mean by that? Well, it was the first full, fully developed settler state uh, on a permanent basis. It had the predecessor of its, you know, there were British uh, settlers who formed the 13 colonies that uh, set up the founding of the United States as a settler state. It was the first founded as a, uh, a settler state, but it had um, the, the people who founded it had the inheritance of British imperialism and British colonization of Ireland. So especially the colonization of Ulster that began in the, in the um, 16, early 1600s when exactly when the British started coming to North America colonizing, you know, in 1607, Jamestown, 1620, uh, Plymouth. Uh, so many of those settlers uh, actually were uh, um, involved in, in, you know, in the colonization of Ireland. So they had uh, experience, plus the British experience of two centuries of of colonization of Ireland, but and then introducing settler colonialism in the northern part, and bringing in um, uh, Scots people as the settlers and Welsh and some English Anglo. Um, these are the Protestants of Northern Ireland. In some ways, we know more about Northern Ireland than the United States because it's still in the news. It's still a problem. Um, just as Israel, you know, the, a more recent founding of a settler state as a settler state, Israel, in 1948. Uh, so you see that in a compressed time, what happened over 300 years in North America, this uh, reducing the indigenous population to these small islands of people, uh, a genocidal process. So genocide is always uh, is really inherent in you know removing people, um, uh, shifting them around, uh, and killing them, of course, which is predominantly uh, the case in North America. So settler colonialism um, did not become the main um, method of. European colonizations. Most of them, even Britain itself, they colonized, um, they certainly did some settler colonialism in Africa, but mainly they did um, uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, local governance of uh, administrative, you know, an administrative, of course, military administrative control, at, like in India and Pakistan, India, um, South Asia. Southeast uh, Asia for the French, but the French did uh, settler colonialism in Algeria. They never came to um, the French uh, settlers. Never came to uh, uh, to be the majority population, but they were certainly working at it and wanted to stay. That, that's a part of what it means. Settler colonialism is is an effort or a process that would lead to be come the majority population that that's the goal of settler colonialism is to get rid of the it's it's a land-based um 
it's a land-based methodology of taking land. And um, that means removing the people who are on that land in order to take that land and have your excess population in the mother country to have some place to go, uh, sort of escape valve, you know, for um, disgruntled people who, uh, who are left behind uh, to give them this possibility of, um, of gaining uh, land and wealth. Um, so it's, that's one, you know, one um, advantage of settler colonialism that small, small overpopulated state, uh, states like European states are very small. British, you know, the core of the British Isles are very small territory. So no way everyone can have land. So it's easy to entice settlers saying, when land is the most important thing in the world, um, it, uh, you can have free land if you just you know, cross this ocean and they don't tell them you're gonna to have to kill people to take it. But <laughs> uh, once they're there, they become, you know, um, uh, they, they become involved. Um, in being settlers, that they probably don't come with a motive of killing people. Uh, but I think um, we um, there's there's a kind of acknowledgement of settler colonialism uh, in the world that exists. Let's say, but for the United States, I think the majority of the population. Uh, has has no clue about it, that that's what they're living in. I, I suspect most people, maybe not the crowd we run with, but most people may not even know what settler colonialism means. Well, I think even most people on the left don't know what it means. You know, I mean, Native people have been, you know, doing scholarship and writing and talking about this, but they're a very small minority of the, you know, of the left and of the field. And it, the thing is that it disrupts all, all previous theories. Marx never dealt with settler colonialism, never dealt with, well, he de they dealt with Ireland, as, but not really as settler colonialism, as exploitation. And, and then the reason for studying Ireland was to see why the British working class was difficult to organize because they had, you know, because of settler colonialism, people could go and um, live in these territories or go overseas. So I think that we have to definitely, to deal with colonialism at all, we, we have to extend Marxism. I consider myself a, a Marxist um, based on, uh, I mean, the Marxism that I embrace is historical materialism as an analytical tool, because I think that's what Marx and Engels were trying to teach us in the future is, you know, the, the facts on the ground when they lived were very different and the knowledge base was very different. I mean, settler colonialism existed, but they had no means of analyzing it in North America. They knew nothing about North America or China, or, you know, they could, they could embrace Oriental despotism as a theory about China, which is very reactionary because that's all the knowledge base they had. So they developed a method of using what they did have for coming up with what was appropriate, at least for Western Europe at the time. But we need to use that to analyze our own specific world and situation. And unless we bring that as the basis of our analysis, settler colonialism, I don't think we'll ever understand, for instance, why we have uh, such a poor working class consciousness and uh, trade unions that are business unions and failing anyway, and a lack of worker solidarity on a sustained basis. And when we did have that moment in the late uh, 19th century of, uh, of worker militancy and uh, building of unions, it was mostly immigrant workers who right. had come with socialist ideas, Germans and Italians and anarcho-syndicalists. 
and not you know the native um, um, the the um, settler people of, of the United States. Does that is that true for Oklahoma? You and I have talked about Oklahoma, where you are from, uh, many times over the years, right. and in your grandfather. Uh, was a radical activist. Did yeah, my you... grandfather was unusual. He was he's Scots Irish, very unusual in being a, a labor militant in the Socialist Party. He also carried an IWW card. He was a veterinarian, and he had some land, so he had nine children. Uh, but he wasn't he wasn't a worker as such. Uh, but he was. I think, uh, and I knew, never knew him, but I've come to assess he, he he was a he was a deeply moral person, and he was an atheist. He wasn't a Presbyterian, a Calvinist, you know, or Southern Baptist or anything. I think that helped. <laughs> um, but he um, most most of the people involved were German socialists, immigrants, in Missouri, Oklahoma, and and uh, Kansas. It was a, like a a bed of socialism, socialist activity. And um, that was largely true that, you know, like the Haymarket, um, the Haymarket martyrs, they were all foreign born, except one, um, Albert Parsons. He was a Texan, uh, but he was married to Lucy Parsons, a black woman from Texas. They had to leave Texas as an interracial couple because they, it was impossible to live there. But he had been a Confederate officer yeah. in Texas. And I threw in, I've done a lot of studying of uh, Lucy um, Parsons. And uh, I, she was, she's the most hardcore, badass leftist who's ever existed, I think, on earth. Um, when her, when her, their son, you know, she's a widow, and their, her son wanted to join Theodore Roosevelt's um, uh, invasion of Cuba. She had him committed to a mental institution. <laughs> I, I mean, who does that? You know, um, it was just wrong. I mean, she tried to talk him out of it, and he insisted on it, so she committed him. Anyway, I believe that she. Um, uh, she supported Albert being executed with the others because they, as they said in their, you know, in, in their uh, discussions with each other, Albert Parsons was important because he was, they used this terminology, the only real American among them, meaning, a, you know, an, uh, a um, old settler descendants from a, so that was gold to have that. So I'm sure my grandfather was very prized because of that, because there were so few uh, from that. I used to kind of, you know, before I understood that myself, understood those dynamics in my own research, um, and it was kind of hard to accept. I, but when I really counted down and knowing, you know, who were the Ku Klux Klan in the, in the neighborhood and all, um, my dad was the only one. Uh, my grandfather was the only one, the only Scots Irish, you know, Oklahoma settler, who joined the. There were um, who joined the notably some women who who joined who who joined uh, who joined the the um, socialist party. Uh, all the others were in the Klan, you know, the other figures who would be political. But there were uh, quite a few women, Anglo women, Anglo and, and Scots Irish women. Uh, that was interesting, but very few men. So I think we we have to understand that period is something that um, they were fresh. A lot of them were fresh immigrants, and it was a period when socialists were being persecuted in um, uh, in Germany, and also. Uh, the Jewish, um, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who were suffering pogroms. So there was a lot of Jewish trade union organizing, especially, you know, in the sewing factories in New York and all. So immigrants have 
in the past, you know, been brought with them uh, a um, uh, thinking that looks like there were periods of of great radicalism, but when it kind of, but then they themselves get Americanized. And that's one of the things in the book that I, I researched that I had not before known the depths of the process of Americanization. I call it a kind of seasoning. Um, historians of, uh, of African slavery um, use the term seasoning for when uh, in the transatlantic slave trade, when the, when the kidnapped Africans who were, most of them had Korans with them. They were Muslim. Many of them were very um, prominent teachers and, you know, town leaders, uh, village leaders and all. When they came, they spoke their own languages. Many of them spoke um, uh uh, spoke um, common, you know, common languages, uh, but they were separated, you know, separated from each other. In the Caribbean, they were seasoned, and then they were, of course, they were half dead by the time they arrived because of the, the conditions um, being strapped down because they would, they definitely would rebel if they weren't strapped down naked uh, in their own, you know, um, uh, their own uh, 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 condition of, you know, uh, of not even having bathrooms or anything. So half of them died. Half of them died on every slave ship. So they had to, in seasoning them, they had to fatten them up. So they treated them like anim animals. Uh, so that seasoning process, uh, a a different form of it, it's more ideological form of seasoning was applied to immigrants um, that came in great numbers uh, with the industrial revolution to work in the, in the factories and the mines and all. And these were Eastern Europeans and Italians, uh, Catholics in great numbers. So, that process of Americanization was very um, thought out. And especially in Theodore Roosevelt's time before, during and after he was president, he was very dedicated to this process. He was an Anglo, um, an Anglo superior, you know, the superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race, he called it. And the only other people who could be included were Celt, possibly Celts, uh, but uh, uh, everyone else was inferior and Native Americans were uh, closer to animals than to, you know, human for him. He was a eugenist as well. Uh, so he did not like these Catholic, uh, dark Italians and these Eastern Europeans. Uh, Jews and also Catholics, Slavs, you know. Uh, so he, he helped produce, among other things, the Catholic Church. Um, they created the uh, Knights of Columbus in 1872. And um, I mean, in 1882. And 1892 was the 400 years of uh, Columbus. And they made a huge um, uh, celebration out of it. So in doing that, they, um, they were, it was founded by the Irish, Irish Catholics, the, the uh, Knights of Columbus. But they, uh, they used this as a mechanism for giving the Italians a uh, original founder, Columbus as the original immigrant, that they should follow his, you know, in his uh, footsteps. And then for the Italian, he was also Italian, supposedly. He was genuine. There was no such thing as Italy at the time. 
1492. He was Genoan, but it was close enough, you know. Uh, so this, this was an ideological project to uh, create a sense of being uh, properly Americanized and to then accept the values and the practices of United States culture um, to be super patriotic, support the foreign wars, to volunteer, to go kill Indians and to kill Filipinos, uh, Guamis and um, Hawaiians and uh, to participate fully. Uh, and so that, that's why Columbus is sort of a cult that got created um, to give something, you know, to, um, uh, I mean, I, I felt in doing that research, I really felt badly for these immigrants coming in because they were very badly treated. And um, it's hard to fault them once they're there, you know, or here, um, they're sending remittances back to their family. They're, you know, we're dependent on them. And so they don't really volunteer, you know, they don't come volunteering to be oppressors, to be settlers, but Americanization is a way of creating the settler mentality. You've always been here because your ancestor Columbus was here, which he wasn't, of course. He never came to any territory uh, the United, of the United States except colony, Puerto Rico, uh, So, uh, which they don't talk about. <laughs> Columbus, they don't tell Puerto Rico, and so oh, Columbus is your, <laughs> is your relative. You know? uh, it's, you know, it's to season these people. So it's a it's a, uh, this is settler colonialism. How, I really wanted to query in this book, how do immigrants become settlers? How do they develop that sense of being belonging to the United States? Um, and of course, some are not, simply not allowed to do that. They remain contingent like Chinese and Asians in general. Uh, since people in the United States can't tell the difference between the Japanese and Chinese usually. Um, the Chinese are the main target, but other Asians uh, get the same treatment uh, in general. So that yellow peril uh, goes back to Marco Polo in the Middle Ages. Marco Polo spent uh, 14 years uh, traveling around China. And this was the greatest, you know, China was the greatest producer of trade goods in the world, Muslims had already um, opened markets in um, also in Indonesia, that's why it's Muslim now, and uh, India and the Holy Roman Empire wanted to take over those supply lines. That's one reason why they sent Columbus to find a shorter way uh, to get to uh, Indonesia, to the Spice Islands was to, um, uh, I mean, it didn't work out, but they were not able to really capture the Muslim supply, uh, supply chains around Africa. And uh, so everything coming in, the China, the silks and all were, you know, Muslim trades. So they, Marco Polo was sent there to try to figure out how that supply chain could be come, you know, come through directly to Europe. And it did open, it opened the Silk Road, it opened a uh, trade road, but it was a one-way one way trade because China had all these things they were making, including gunpowder, unfortunately. Um, and the Europeans weren't making anything that Chinese needed or wanted. They weren't manufacturing anything. Um, all they were doing is trying to, you know, um, uh, uh, the Crusades, you know, invading um, <laughs> invading the Middle East, trying to take, looting, literally looting other countries. Uh, so it was, a, it was a trade imbalance that um, then they got haunted by this idea that, you know, China would be 
would control them someday, but China has never tried to control, you know, the West. They're all about trade, you know, still today. There's this not only fear, war on the horizon that the United States is threatening with its warships in the South China Sea. So none of these things are just history. That's, you know, that's the real point in this book is the history is important to know that it's not recent development, but knowing how deeply its roots are is pretty scary because it from generation to generation is replicated. So we, we simply inherit these attitudes, you know, the general U.S. public, and it's very dangerous. You know. Is settler colonialism something that's unique to modern history? And I say modern history, I'm thinking sort of where we might start to trace the modern world around the 15th century or, or, or so. Um, is this something that's unique to, to modern recent history? And, and if so, what was the switch that, that started it or that caused it? Well, there were always always migrations, you know, the in in the Western Hemisphere. I know the migrations best in the Western Hemisphere. Um, they came out of um, out of a center, out of Mesoamerica, and um, and occupy. I mean, it was more, you know, developing in spaces that weren't yet populated. Um, migrations uh, across oceans and all they weren't they weren't um, uh, settler colonialism um, the migration of Athabascan people there's still Athabascan people of course in Alaska and in in Canada uh, in the subarctic and Arctic but some Athabascans who are now called Navajo and Apache in the Southwest are Athabascans who migrated about only about two centuries before Columbus, before the Europeans came. And they were fairly new to the Southwest um, where you had the Pueblos, uh, 98 city states along the Northern uh, Rio Grande River in, uh, in New Mexico. They had previously lived on the uh, plateau, the Colorado Plateau, they had huge irrigation uh, works, and you know they were intensive farmers, and had um, uh, multi-story uh, buildings, uh, apartment buildings. You know that the their their they lived in not separate little houses. Really, I mean, it's still today they have this. They reduced to nineteen. Uh, 19 city states now, but the Spanish reduced them within 30 years to 21 from 98. That's how violent that conquest was of the Pueblos. But the um, the Navajos and Apaches were not didn't at all come as settler settler colonialists. They were in kind of in awe. They were they were a um, a trading people and um, uh, and and game game hunters. Uh, they may have uh, uh, followed follow, followed game to the south, been attracted to the south. Um, so they they had they had they would um, camp around the pueblos and they had interchanges with them. And most, um, I did a whole book on this called Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico. Uh, it was very interesting to me. It was the first case study I had done of uh, colonialism, of Spanish, uh, and then was the period of Mexico, was that really colonialism and then US uh, uh, occupation and definitely uh, settler colonialism. But the Spanish did, uh, generally they weren't doing settler colonialism, but they did settler colonialism in uh, New Mexico. 
and later in the late 18th century in the cone of South America, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay um, were settler. You know, they were imitating the success of the United States basically as um, um, settler colonialism, bringing in mainly um, Italian and German immigrants to settle the lands and vicious, vicious ethnic cleansing, um, really more violent even than in, in a shorter time. Than I mean, we're talking replacing people like, like yeah. you have in America, Canada, some Latin right. American countries. And, and hence, you can see the difference between the United States and Mexico, between Spanish colonialism right, and, I guess, British settler colonialism. Yeah, Spanish colonialism was primarily, at least in the early stage, administrative. Um, only, you know, people were posted in, in the Americas. Um, some stayed, especially the Basque who came with different conquests, tended to stay and become, and they were, it was descendants of Basque who settled New Mexico. So they had kind of become settler colonialists in their own way. Uh, but the, um, the actual Spanish DNA, if it's ever done and counted in Mexico is, is very, very minor, actually very, you know, a, a very limited number of people because since it was mainly administrative uh, in New Mexico alone, they kept replacing, you know, sending back um, and imprisoning almost everyone, every administrator uh, was kind of corrupt and they kept replacing them. But the main people they brought with them who were not listed on the um, on the rolls were uh, conquered native people that they brought to New Mexico as, as settlers. Uh, so that's a whole, you know, a whole complicated uh, situation. But settler colonialism in um, as a um, in pre-colonial times, I, I don't think you could call it that. There were some, there were always, of course, some uh, uh, conflicts over, um, you know, delineation of peoples uh, that might have have wars, but not really wars of conquest and uh, and. Um, and elimination was mainly, at least in the Western Hemisphere, uh, if you know some great tragedy happened, uh, and there were diseases in the Americas. It's not true that it was disease-free and no one had immunity. They just didn't have a, a immunity to being starving and being refugees. So that you know that's where diseases spread very fast. Uh, they had bubonic plague in uh, in the Southwest, but there's it's interesting what you can do without capitalism. When there was one person diagnosed with bubonic plague, they would burn the whole city down and leave and rebuild somewhere else. Extreme caution to save human lives. If we had that attitude now, we could deal with, well, we never would have created global warming. But if there's no, if there's no capital investment, human life is the only thing that matters and social relations. So you do what is necessary. And when the Spanish came in, they didn't allow that. They said, these people are burning their, their villages down. We can't have that. So they, you know, died of disease because um, they knew how to diagnose it and, and deal with it. But the Spanish uh, didn't allow it, you know, once they conquered. Um, so this is, you know, this was partly the decline of, uh, of those city-states, of those villages. The numbers is, is, was disease. Um, so... Settler colonialism is definitely uh, an Anglo, an Anglo invention. 
Um, it could be, you know, that that um, I know Mahmoud uh, Mandami, a uh, wonderful Ugandan, uh, Asian, um, East Asian, um, I mean, South Asian um, historian at Columbia University. He, his new book is called Neither Settler Nor Native. And he analyzes, I had never really thought of uh, the Iberian Peninsula as a settler colonial site. Um, and he analyzes it as such because they did a uh, six centuries of ethnic cleansing of the Muslims and Jews. Of course, I knew that, but I didn't really think of it as settler colonialism. But they were, were of course, bringing their settlers in to take over, um, you know, that beautiful architecture and the buildings and, and the, the orchards and everything that the the Muslims created in Iberia. And then they deported, you know, about the same time Columbus voyaged uh, to the Western hemisphere, uh, they, they did mass deportations of the Jews and the, uh, uh, and the Muslims ethnically cleansed and then moved their own people in. So that was like 1490, um, well, five centuries, but it culminated in the deportations in 1492 through 1496 or so, shiploads of people being dumped on North Africa. Uh, and um, much of the population of Tunisia and Libya and all are, you know, from those deportations. And then, of course, the Sephardi Jewish people uh, who were, went, you know, to various places. Um, so this, and so it was purely a you know a Castilian, um, uh, very light people from the north, blue-eyed blondes. Not you know not. Uh, um, there had been um, so that's you know that's a er, very early form pre uh, pre British form of settler colonialism. That that's important, and the British may have take a note of it in their own, I don't think that's been documented, but um, it makes sense that they might have taken note of that in their own behavior in Ireland, that it seemed to work for the, um, you know, for the Spanish uh, profitably. But capitalism came out of this too. You know, Marx writes that uh, this was the the looting of the Americas and the enslavement of Africans was the, what he called the rosy dawn of um, the, uh, uh, of capitalism, of the uh, development of capitalism. So I think that's another problem with, you know, uh, US Marxists is the refusal to acknowledge that as the, because they, they're kind of focused on the English working class as being the origins of capitalism. And um, that, that again, doesn't give then, a, you know, a, um, allow for a um, portal to see U.S. development because using, using a template that doesn't really apply to a colonized place, the template of of uh, uh, you know the English working class, um, so that's you know E. P. Thompson is has a huge influence on uh, U.S. theorists of uh, the origins of capitalism. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Her latest book is called. Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. Do you think, when I'm, when I'm thinking about the history of settler colonialism and then maybe just the history of civilization in of itself, and it sounds like we don't find what we'd call settler colonialism in older empires or even the ancient ones, Persia, Rome, the Ottomans, if this is more of a sort of modern historical uh, invention, 
was technology is technology connected to it was was were there technological advancements even the industrial revolution which would be a little bit later but help propel uh settler colonialism because now it made it more feasible possible easier to be able to bring one people from one part of the world and trying to replace another people in another part of the world well, I hadn't thought of that. Um, I think the new studies of, of um, the origin of capitalism in the United States um, is very important um, and not something that really U.S. Marxists want to accept at all unless, you know, they're African-American. Uh, but that the, the cotton kingdom was the basis of the Industrial Revolution, not not the 1870s, you know, what classically what's identified as the beginning of industrial capitalism. Um, it really started, and I think Walter Johnson's River of Dark Dreams is the best source. Um, there are other, it's not the only one, and um, it's, it's now, a, you know, a, a subject of important studies, but I think he, he, analyzes it and some of the documentation he comes up with is um, is the most thorough and convincing that the industrial revolution originated in the period 1820 to 1850. Um, by 1850, the United States had the largest GDP in the world and it was totally based on the cotton kingdom. There was no industrial, there were, you know, no, no factories, none of that had been developed, you know, it came with the, the railroads. Um, it was all steamboat, you know, technology um, and, um, and uh, slavery, massive slavery and reproduction of slaves because the international slave trade was outlawed. And, um, the United States didn't want to uh, participate in that, but the British Navy, you know, in a, a proactively prevented uh, the United States from shipping uh, slaves. So they began in Virginia and South Carolina, which were the big first slave colonies and then states had totally ruined their, um, uh, their soils by, uh, by you know um, non-food crops, uh, not leaving land fallow, you know, raising just um, um, a cotton and tobacco, and um, uh, and it was you know they had leached uh, the land, so they were having you know having problems um, financially. And they turned to slave reproduction, factory, literally factory reproduction of slaves, of uh, forcing uh, enslaved women uh, to produce, con you know, until they died uh, from the time they could reproduce until they were, if they were possible, live to 30 maybe uh, and have 20 children even. Uh, that could be sold, you know, taken from them and sold over into the cotton kingdom. So this, this factory production of human life, bodies, not only that, these bodies as commodities made up uh, assets greater than all other U.S. assets combined all of the money in banks, in equipment, in land, all together did it come to the value of those bodies that were sold on the auction block. So that's in addition to labor, forced labor, free, unpaid labor. But generally before that's not been emphasized, you know, the, the commodification of the body and what that means then with um, emancipation, that body has no value. It can be shot, killed, anything, it's no longer 
on the auction block. So I think we have to understand uh, continuing devaluation of the of black bodies in, in that context. Um, and it won't go away until we acknowledge it and pay reparations, <laughs> I believe. Um, and huge apologies and, and acknowledgements. Um, but it is, you know, it is known. So the, the technology of, um, of, uh, of cotton, of course, this is what fed the textile industry, which was everyone knows, you know, the, that about England. That's part of the whole, you know, theory about the English working class. But actually the, um, uh, the source of that, you know, end product was, was coming from the industry in the Mississippi River Valley in the Cotton Kingdom. Uh, so that was, you know, the origin of capitalism in the United States is uh, set, you know, by, by 1840. And it's usually dated to the 1870s. I actually think it was, uh, the United States was founded as a capitalist state. It wasn't yet fully functional, but it was founded for that purpose. And of course, my first chapter is on Alexander Hamilton and his role in making that the case. He was the first banker, of course, but he was also a militarist. You know, he led the George Washington's army. And um, uh, so he, this, this term that's been created, the fiscal military state, the United States founded as a fiscal military state, a state made for war, and I would say a capitalist state made for war. And I find it significant that the very first, uh, the very first factory in the United States was created by Alexander Hamilton uh, during the 10 year war of independence. And it was a gun factory, a, an armory. Um, so it's, no accident, we have we have the greatest gun industry in the world. Forty uh, percent of uh, the world world's guns are manufactured in the United States, in a country that is supposed to be uh, deindustrialized. Right, that that industry hasn't gone away, and it was the first mm -hmm. one established. So the militarism that uh, is inherent in the constitution itself, you know. There's a very good uh, source that um, a, a Stanford uh, law professor and historian, uh, Gregory Blasky, uh, he's done a lot of other work too, but this, the Savage Constitution, it's a 90 page law review article that's available online and it's very, very important for understanding. He didn't create the term fiscal military state, but he borrows it from um, a source that did. And um, it's, I think we have to go back to the very origins of the United States and not just theoretically, but because the constitution is considered a sacred document in the United States and it is practically impossible to change it except the whims of the Supreme Court interpreting it, you know, like a Ouija board <laughs> so, um, that we can't change it. You know, it, it it's just practically impossible. And um, it's, uh, it was meant to be, you know, like that. Uh, and it serves very well, it serves capitalism very well. The Constitution does. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I think the, you know, the, it's a problem within the um, culture itself, because in the culture itself, even the people who are most critical of the United States and even ultra leftists, let's say, except for maybe anarchists who don't have an analysis of it, but, you know, just don't like governments or states at all. Um, 
do not, you know, they, they rever the constitution. You know, the, if we could just get a few things out of it, like the electoral college and, and states rights, but that's the essence of it. You know, that would be rewriting a whole new constitution. You can't just take out the core of the whole thing. That's what it's about. And that's what it was meant for, you know? So as long as we're wedded to, um, uh, to this, you know, sacred document, it's, um, we're doomed. I, unfortunately, taking the world with us too. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it immobilizes anything that any change, you know, that could come. How does settler world. colonialism work today? Well, it's still uh, at work. Uh, you know, the, the, in early capitalism, the main commodity in the United States besides uh, slave bodies was land. Uh, so settler colonialism is the driver of, um, of United States uh, obsession with real estate. I thought it was very interesting when Trump was elected as a real estate man, because if there's an arc from him to George Washington, George Washington was the biggest real estate man, the biggest land speculator in the colonies. He made his fortune by the time he was 22 by being uh, a um, land speculator, taking his militia up into um, up into the unceded territories of native people. This was under the British. Uh, they, uh, they had not conquered and didn't want to conquer. They didn't want to move any farther. But he would go up, they had the intention, this is like in 1724, 1730s, that George Washington was uh, going and um, uh, was a little later, 1730s, when he was going and, and um, mapping, you know, we always hear he's a surveyor. I always, I couldn't figure out that when I was young, that George Washington was a surveyor because, you know, the way he was dressed and, and you know, his little white boots and everything, I couldn't imagine it because my cousin was a surveyor and he was muddy all the time. You know, he tromped around the mud and it was a proletarian occupation. So I couldn't quite imagine. No one could answer my question. You know, um, why, why, why was he surveying? Well, he, he wasn't himself doing the surveying, but his militia, he would take his militia up and they would survey unseated native land and go back and sell it, sell these deeds for good money. That's how he made his fortune, became what would now be a, a billionaire um, with unseated land, you know, illegal under British law. They were still under the British. And he wasn't the only one, he was just the biggest one, you know, the, the, the one that got riches from it. So that when they get to, you know, breaking with Britain, they're all, you know, they all have these illegal deeds. If they can't cross over and conquer that land and get rid of the Indians and actually make those deeds good, uh, they're in trouble. So it's, an, it's the main cause for splitting with Britain is Britain um, drew a line, a proclamation line over which uh the colonists were to go no farther. That was Indian country. It was going to stay Indian country. And, and this, is after, the, this mm -hmm. is after the so-called seven-year war. Yeah, this was after, the and they, they didn't want any more war. They won the war, but they didn't want any more wars with France. France, you know, it would just be Indian territory where, where the French and the British and everyone could do trading, you know, and have trading posts, but not remove the people um, Native people were very involved in the fur trade, unfortunately. Uh, but they, you know, that that's what uh, was wealth producing. The furs were more important than that land in particular. But the settlers 
wanted land. So I think we have to understand that land in Europe under monarchies all belonged to the monarch. You know, there was there wasn't really private property. It was it something granted and only to the wealthy. And it was very special thing, your castle on the hill. But imagine, you know, poor people having offered their castle on the hill, their own land. This is, this is something, I, I mean, coming from a tenant farming family, you know, the desire to have land is, is the dream, you know, um, uh, even in, you know, in, in my lifetime. So imagine what it was when there was no one, you couldn't even buy, you know, a square inch of land that you could call your own. And here you are invited to come and simply take it for nothing, free land, or, you know, very little, pay very little for deeds. So it's very interesting that, you know, this arc from George Washington to, to Donald Trump, and also the fact that um, real estate is still the driver of the U.S. economy. And we found that out in 2008, didn't we, you know, with the collapse of the real estate market. So that's definitely an arc of history that I don't think people really understand the continuing importance under settler colonial. It makes no sense without understanding settler colonialism and why land is uh, the most important commodity. And to know in most countries, it's not the most important commodity. You know, in non-settler states, it's not. I mean, you know, people value owning land, but it's not the most important commodity. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz has been our guest. She has joined us for a conversation about many things, including our book, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Southern Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, always wonderful to spend time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitch. I really enjoyed talking to you. <laughs>